All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's look a little at um, what a design expert actually does. I'm not going to teach you to be a design expert, but I'm going to give you an idea. One of the important thing is we don't teach design. It's not something you just read a book and be a design expert. You need more than that. It's part experience, part technical knowledge, part business knowledge of a design expert. It's not easy. Just drawing some stuff in Visio and put it online and everything's good. It's not that easy. We need a little more. And it's not just plumbing anymore. Because today it is a business tool. Any business that runs their operation needs some kind of networking to be successful. So you can't just do some simple plumbing anymore. It needs to be solid design and you need a solid routing design. So if your layer three doesn't work, well, you have a problem. You definitely need to make sure everything's work with a focus on the routing design. Let's face it, every day we hit injury issues with bad designs that are made by bad decisions, not enough money, whatever it might be. So as a network designer, it's your job to figure out how well can I get along with all the requirements that people will give me in what I need to do. So the first thing you need to do if you're assigned to anything that relates to networking or design, figure out where are you. Collect information about anything, the current state of the network, make sure it's all there. You talk to people, because especially if you're brought in as an external consultant, you have probably zero knowledge about the network outside of the, the organization. You need to talk to people. You need to figure out where are we going with this? What are our goals? What are constraints? What's the strategy of the company? If it's a, a business that runs all our operations online, you probably need even more redundancy, more resiliency in the network compared to, let's say, a company that doesn't rely as much on it. And you have to consider everything. And if you don't know it, you have to ask for it. But every information they will give you is what you need to consider. And it is a lot of information you need to process. First of all, you also need to don't have, you might have your preferences on protocols, technologies, but you can't just stick with them and say, this is how it's gonna be. You can't just say, I'm gonna run BTP here. I don't care what they say, it's BTP. It's not the case. You have to figure out what is a good match, not just say it's BGP. It could be a good starting point, but you definitely need to make sure you have open mind to what else might come in during your information gathering process. Don't make assumptions. Another thing, if you're in doubt, go back, talk to the relevant people, make sure you have all the information you need so you don't end up making a bad decision because you didn't have the information and it was you made the wrong decision. That's not going to have them call you back and say, hey, please come back and fix our network. It's going to say, hey, you didn't do a good job. Thanks for your help, but uh, we'll look for somebody else. Parents, you need it. Probably, at least when you're talking content of the CCDE, right? you need experience. Probably somewhere from five to seven years before you're ready to tackle the, the exam. But the more experience you have, the better network engineer, network designer will you be. If you're brand new, you haven't been working on too long, you might fall into some of these pitfalls here, not be open-minded, not talk to relevant people. That comes with experience. You will learn to see some of the pitfalls. Oh, if I don't ask this question, I'm gonna be in trouble. That's why you need to continuously be better educating yourself, getting better at gathering all the information and experience will teach you how to do it, when to do it, and how to do it. So this is kind of like the typical expectation. This is not an exhaustive list, but you need to analyze and understand everything. That's a, that's a given. You need to be able to sit down, given a set of documentation, figure out, okay, where are we at? And make sure whatever you do, 
align it with the business goal and strategies. Don't, again, don't just because you think, oh, this would be cool to do here. If it doesn't support the business requirements or the goals, they couldn't care less about it. They would just say, why did you do that? And you need to be able to justify your decisions. You need to know the customer. The better you know them as a company, as a business, as an organization, the better you know them, the better you will understand their need, their requirements, what they're looking for. Of course, technical is important too. And you get that solid understanding by asking the why questions. When you ask the why questions, this is where you start making sense of the business and actually be a value to them. But the, you don't just throw in a bunch of new technologies, routers, and switches. You know why they need it. You have to done your due diligence and figure out why do we need these switches? Why do we need this new fancy protocol? Why do we need VXLAN? Why do we need whatever it might be? And you have to size it right. Don't gold plate it just because it looks cool. No business will say thank you if you end up oversizing their network, having to spend double the amount of money they could have gotten away with. Size it right, that's the important part. And you need to know your business understanding in terms of CapEx, OPEX, total cost of ownership, return on investment. You need to understand it because they will have some kind of expectation that you know that money still is the final decision making in any network design process. So what you usually will do is you will build up a high level design, which will contain, you know, contain, contain a proposed design based on the list of criteria that you base your decisions on. So at least it's documented. These are the reasons I made this design because you have these requirements and these restraints, these goals and whatnot. And you, of course, tell them also, how do I meet your requirement with the design? How, what is it in here that actually helps you get your work done or support your business, support your organization? That's also important because that will, again, is the real value to the customer. And you need to justify. Whatever you have, any decision you make, be the choice of a routing protocol, the choice of a technology, at any time, you must be able to justify why did I choose this? This goes back to some, all the requirements that you have, but you need to have a statement that because of, and then list all the requirements, I chose technology XYZ. You'll probably also be involved in building migration planning. Um, make sure that everybody who's involved knows what to do, stakeholders. It's probably going to be mini project manager hopefully not a full-time project manager because you have enough on your plate just dealing with the design, but you need to know who to reach out to and who's responsible when you start doing a migration. Probably gonna be part of the high-level design as well. In some cases, you'll also be expected to build bill of materials, statement of works, just to make sure that everybody's aligned with what is this gonna cost and what do we need to order? Of course, that's at the end of the day, some CFO is gonna hit the green button, the green go or the red no button. And this is where the bill of materials or in statement of works are coming into to play. So a simple example, because we don't have more than 20 minutes, so I can give you a full, full design example. So here we just have a company that has a very simple 2T network data center design or campus design or enterprise design depending on what you want. And very simple network. I'm gonna give you an idea of how this relatively simple network when expanding it, how different solutions you can choose based on the requirements that you have and the things you need to look for to be able to determine which direction do I need to go. So the first one, the customer you talk to, let's assume you've talked to all the relevant parties within the network and they give you like, okay, we need additional capacity we need a second data center site. And there's 15 kilometers between sites, or that's gonna be around 10 miles for US-based people. They want full layer two mobility, and they have lots of fiber. Okay, cool. But is this much to go with? It doesn't give you any, like, 
what do we actually expect from this? They have like some basic requirements, but it doesn't really do a lot, give you a lot of information. So, okay, we let's play with the notion that, okay, we're gonna make a second data center side, we're just gonna replicate everything to the second side. That's a good starting point, right? How do we actually connect them together? And how do we do it? Because there are different ways to do it. Do we use dark fiber, layer two extensions, some kind of WDM, do we use a controller-based network, is it Metro Ethernet-based, all these kind of things. This is where you know, okay, how can I, in fact, actually connect these two networks together, these two sides? What are my options? Just, just a brainstorming process, what are the oh, kind of like, what options is available to me? And what are the answer? What would you guess? Well, you heard it, it depends. Because you need to look at the context you're in. So that not only means the physical requirement, doesn't necessarily mean the technical requirements, but also what can the customer provide and what, can, what are they looking for? So let's take that you gather additional information, you're asking this relevant, the network engineers, the networking staff with the company. And they say, okay, we all have a couple of people and we're always busy. We don't have any time for training. We don't have time for anything. We're just busy doing, supporting whatever we already have. And they want to do things the simple way. They don't want like super fancy stuff. They just get things done, make it work. There's no plan for automation. I know it's probably not gonna happen these days, but it could happen. And they want something that's based off of standards. They want anything proprietary. They just want open standards all the way. They have already you know, bought all the hardware. They have no more CapEx available. No more money to buy stuff from. So you already have the hardware that you know sets kind of a limitation to you that you don't have any money available, right? You have some OPEX, so it means you have some operational spending you can do, but you can't buy stuff. So look at this one here. We do a simple layer two extension, port channels. It works. It is simple. It meets the requirements of being standards-based. You can use LACP to make sure it's all standards-based. And it's simple, and it doesn't rely, require our new training to be done Staff doesn't need additional training because this is something they already know, right? Let's go back, rewind a bit, go back. Now we take about, go back and now we assume that you learned that they can add, you know, they can accept some kind of complexity, added complexity to the mix. Again, to a certain degree, if it makes sense, okay? They want as much control of the end-to-end -end path as possible. So they want to rely on Anybody exter external to you know, provide circuits and things like that? You have some CapEx bought you available, so you can go out and buy some gear. It's always, we have, come on, we love buying gear, right? So we always wanna, if I can buy stuff, it's cool. I can do more than with, if I didn't have any money. And they want automation because they believe maybe they are going to grow and they need something that can support the business going forward, which means some kind of automation and with some sort of managed or centralized policy management. And they expect a threefold increase in the needed number of links between those two sites within the next month, 12 months. Okay, that also gives you some idea of this is going to grow fast. And how can we actually support this, keeping everything else in mind? They want control of the end-to-end -end path. Okay, let's look at how it looks now. Well, Sure, it looks like we have like a, a IP or VXLAN based fabric or BGP EV pin fabric. We have a spine leaf situation and we connect the line, you know, connected into say using standard leaf to leaf. And now we have to lay a two extension or the VXLAN based layer two extension all of a sudden. And maybe we add, well, maybe we add some DWDM. We had money to buy stuff from. If we can buy. DWM equipment or CWDM for that matter, because we know they're going to need, I don't know, three to the, three to you know, about yeah, twelve more links over the next twelve months. They're going to need a lot of more links, so they also want that full control of the path. So they probably don't want to rely on a telco provider to give them the provide them the access. They want full control. They have we recall from the general requirements they have lots of fiber available. So why not do the wave aggregation ourselves? 
because we have the money available to buy the required devices. But at the end of the day, all we get from this is layer two mobility across these two sides, which can be achieved by both solutions. But we have various, you know, different ways and different requirements that we have to meet. And this allows us to do something else. Is one better than the other? No. It depends on what the customer wants and what do you think is going to be the correct choice based on all these requirements that you have been given. So it's all about the details. More than one way to do things, as there always are in our line of business. It's always 20 different ways of doing things. You just have to figure out which one is right for this, or maybe which ones. There could be more than one way to do it. And then, of course, if that's your decision that we need to choose between these two, well, you can describe both options. Let the customer decide based on what you tell them. They can decide whether they want to go one way or the other. You give them the final recommendations, and off they go. Look for some of the key information here is, is it a must, prefer, require, expect? Is it nice to have? Is it need to have? Because if it's a need to have, of course, it's a more hard requirement. If it's nice to have, well, then it's something you can consider if there's room for it in the budget or if there's room for it in the technical you know, expansion, the complexity, well, we can add it in if necessary. Ask questions. If you don't know what the problem is or you don't know what the answer is, ask. And you can't probably go to one person because you need to go to maybe the CFO and the networking staff or whatever it might be in the organization. You, one person won't have all the answers. So you need to be a good communicator. You need to be able to talk to people, to be able to, don't be afraid to ask the questions essentially. Spend the time you need. Don't rush through the information gathering process. It is going to be hitting you with, as a boomerang later on. You don't want that. You want to make sure you have all the information at, from the beginning or at least 90% of it. So you only have to go back and make some final tweaks or changes to the final design. And finally, don't forget what the business expect. Don't look at the technical only. Look at what they expect, what they want to do at the end of the day. And money, let's face it, we have to consider it. It's always going to be a limiting factor. It's always going to be that final, ultimate decision-making issue is money. And as an engineer, I'm an engineer. I love playing with new stuff. I like playing with cool stuff. But, uh, but I, I don't really always care about the money, right? But let's face it, when you do design, you have to consider money. Because you won't get on just by saying, hey, we don't care about the money. We have enough. It's never... The, let me know if, if ever, anyone ever you get to a situation where you have a project where you don't have money issues, I want to join in on that project. It's, that will be fun because it doesn't happen, right? So in context of the CCD, right, this is what we test you on. We test you on these very specific topics. We will test your ability to analyze the current environment. We'll test you on how to gather, can you, are you able to gather the correct information? And are you able to process it? Are you able to take both business requirements, technical requirements, and everything else into consideration when you make a decision? Can you make the design decisions and can you justify it? That is the important part. Can you justify? Whenever you, you're faced with a question in the CCDE, you should be able to justify it at any time. So. Why did I choose this? Why do I believe this is the correct option? And then you go back, this is because of this requirement, this requirement, and this requirement, and this statement here, all right? At the end, you will have a final solution that is going to meet the, hopefully meet all the requirements that the customer has. And I'm not gonna kid, kid you, it's a long exam, it's eight hours, there's going to be four scenarios that are going to be completely independent. But it's going to test you on, each scenario is going to test you on these aspects. So each scenario is a two-hour block where you are working with a given set of information, a given set of constraints, given set of customer, what kind of customer. Could it be retail? Could it be, I don't know, some kind of other production-based company or whatever it might be? 
But at the end of the day, it's two hours for each scenario. They are not connected. So whenever you finish one scenario, it's a new situation. You clear your mind, you get started on the next one because it's a new situation with different set of requirements, different goals, different strategies you have to meet. And it is eight hours that is going to be, be long. I know of, I can see a few people that I know have taken the exam in the past. And I know it's, they know it's, it's a long, really long day. But I, I'm, I can almost guarantee you that once you pass the exam, it's going to change your career. Because what we can do as the CCDE is bridge the gap between the business and the technologies. So you can speak both to CXO level people. You can also speak to network engineers and understand what they're talking about. So you can bridge the gap between technology and business. And that makes you stand out as a network engineer, as a designer, as an architect. You don't only focus on the technical side, you focus on the business sides as well. There's gonna be a lot of information in the exam, like really a lot you have to read and process, but it's part of the exam and it's built so you don't run out of time. So we, of course, we adjust, make sure that the, whatever you need to read is not gonna overwhelm you from a time perspective. There will be time to get it done. But first of all, do not fight the test. Your preconceived notions and ideas is essentially fighting the test because you're telling the exam, hey, you're wrong. This is how I would do it. Well, that's not what we're asking you. We're asking you to do, test you on, in this situation, what is the right answer? What are the right ways to think? So this is a total change of mindset. If anybody of you have taken CCNP, CCIE, you know it's, it's technology and it's important to know the technology, but here we're gonna test you on, do you know your stuff and do you know how to meet all the requirements, right? And with that said, that actually got to my session within the, a lot of time, so that's perfect. But before I go, everyone have a look under your chair to see if there's a raffle ticket. And if you find one, let me put up.